It's 2011. Larry Crown, a middle-aged, divorced, retired Navy cook, is a charming person who loves his job at the Superstore U-Mart. He's the kind of guy who's loved by everyone and always has a smile on his face. He's happy and super satisfied with his life and his job. He jokes around with his colleagues like the lovable man he is. A good day of work fulfills him, and he takes pride in his status as the eight-time winner of the Employee of the Month Award. It is another regular day in Larry's simple life and he's sorting clothes on a hanger, chatting away with a colleague when he hears the announcement. He is being summoned to the common break room. Larry wonders why, when his colleague reminds him that it's Employee of the Month Day. Larry is ecstatic. He laughs joyously because it would be his ninth award in a row. With happy thoughts and expectations, Larry goes to the break area where his superiors are waiting for him. He enters and strikes up a conversation with Vicky, a stern blonde woman in a pantsuit, asking her why she wasn't at Alvarez's baby pool. Vicky tells him slightly condescendingly that front office personnel does not involve themselves with hourly staff, which is the group Larry belongs to. These people were Larry's colleagues who got promoted above him and he was left behind. Larry seems to have no regret or bitterness about that. Cheerful as he is, Larry takes a seat and says he knows why he was called in. He is grinning when Jack bursts his bubble saying he's sure he doesn't. Larry is sipping on coffee when Cox informs him there has been a company-wide restructuring order and that they are going to have to let him go. At first, Larry is confused. He almost thinks he has heard him wrong. Ms. Vicky takes Larry through the company policy and informs him that a review of the employee records revealed that Larry had never attended a college. That made him an undesirable employee going forward. Still confused and taken aback, Larry has a hard time accepting that he's being fired. Jack makes a joke about Larry's growth being forever retarded in the company because he never went to college. He flaunts his college ring and so does Andrews. Larry, who is still digesting this new information realizes that this was the reason why he never made it to the front office, despite being a dedicated employee. Larry's completely discombobulated. He tells them about how he joined the Navy right out of high school and stayed there for 20 years. But no one cares. After all, he was just a cook. Cox offers Larry a genuine thanks for his service to the nation, and in addition, to you Mart as well, however, that's over with now. Larry is being fired and the gravity of the truth hits him like a tidal wave at that moment. It's final and he can't do anything to undo it. Years of hard and honest work was taken away in a blink of an eye. Larry is in utter and overwhelming shock. He refutes, now panicking as the situation gets real, pleading with his employers, saying he can't be fired. That these last few years have been tough, and he can't afford this. Jack laughs it off again, making fun of how everyone's ex-wives have cleaned their pockets right out. In a very straightforward manner, Cox tells Larry how the timing will always be bad when it comes to these things. Larry almost tears up, his voice shaking, because he came in there thinking he was going to be the employee of the month. This is a disaster. Disheartened and dejected, Larry drives back home on autopilot. He's numb and still reeling from the shock of it all. He lies down on the bed and gives himself time to digest this day's events. Night comes, and Larry finally gets out of his work uniform, hangs it in the closet, and shuts the door with a last saddened glance. Undeterred by the sudden life-altering event, Larry wakes up the next day and starts calling places to look for a job. But all he's met with is rejection. He takes a moment to regain his wits and restarts his day. He irons out his clothes and over the next few days, goes on interviews, checks out whichever vacant position he can, and pushes forward to find a new job. Place after place, Larry comes out dejected and rejected. Times are tough, is what the employers tell him. Larry needs to start getting his affairs in order. He goes to the bank in hopes that he could refinance the mortgage that he took on his house. The teller cheerily tells him that he could still pay off the 392,000 he owes. She laughs sheepishly when Larry demands to refinance the loan. Times have changed, she tells him. Now that he's unemployed, and his house isn't worth what Larry still owes the bank, they can't process his request. The teller offers him a complimentary coffee and tells him they have lots of good things to discuss, first of which is liquidating his assets. Larry is utterly dejected. He is stuck in a hard place. The next morning, Larry's carrying his stuff out for a yard sale when Lamar, Larry's friendly neighbor and best friend, storms up to him, smoking a pipe. Larry can't have a yard sale because it's Lamar's thing. Lamar claims he's had a monopoly on yard sales in their neighborhood. Larry defeatedly tells Lamar that he got laid off a week ago. Lamar consoles him by sharing his own experience. Larry confides in him. He was told it was because he didn't go to college. Lamar practically rolls his eyes at that. Speaking from experience and being a black man, Lamar doesn't believe in the excuse they fired Larry. He asks if Larry is going on unemployment. Larry might have to if push comes to shove. He regrets taking a loan and buying out half of the house of his ex-wife Denise. Lamar invites Larry to his garage. There, Lamar's wife, Bella, happily offers Larry a record of dance lessons from the 50s. Lamar dismisses her, saying Larry can't afford it on account of losing his job. Lamar rummages through his stuff and produces a community college catalog. 
He hands it to Larry. Larry flips through the catalog and Bella tells him you're never too old to learn. She tells him to listen to Lamar since he hasn't called anyone boss in years. Larry scoffs, remembering why that is. Lamar had won a $500,000 lottery a couple of years ago. When Lamar asks 50 cents for the catalog, Larry argues that they give them away for free. Lamar retorts that they do, but he doesn't. The duo starts to haggle and Bella shakes her head because it's what they always do. Larry shows up at the East Valley Community College. He wanders outside and finds the admissions building. He's checking out the brochure when Dave Buisick, Dean of Student Services approaches him. They shake hands. Dave is amused by Larry's decision to be back at college. Larry tells him it's his first time. Dave doesn't seem to mind or judge that. He assumes Larry was a Coast Guard. Larry corrects him, not too proud to say he was a cook. Dave is undeterred. Culinary specialist, he offers with a smile. He informs Larry of their course on hotel and restaurant food preparation. Larry says no to that. He's had enough of being a cook. He informs Dave he was doing something different before he was downsized. He's here to make sure it never happens again. Dave recommends Larry a few classes. Speech 217 will change Larry's life, Dave says. He'll like the teacher, he adds with an insinuating wink. Dave tells him about the three classes that will change Larry for the better. He just needs to get in there and put in the work. Larry is determined to do it. He gets enrolled, student ID in hand, and Larry is ready for this next challenge of his life. While at a gas station, filling up his car, Larry notices two young men on scooters. One of the men fills up gas in his scooter and Larry is shocked at how less he had to pay. His car's tank is still not filled up while the young man pays nickels for gas. This baffles Larry. He goes to Lamar's yard sale wanting to buy Lamar's old scooter. It's obviously economical and Larry needs to save money now more than ever. Bella tells Larry that he can sell his albums on eBay for a good price. Lamar returns with his good tools and offers to sell the scooter for $800. Like always, they engage in a comical haggle and Bella couldn't be more over it. Larry stresses how he has no money and no job. Lamar is relentless. It's all in good spirits. Larry eventually trades the scooter for his flat screen. He decides to test how fast the scooter can go but runs right into Lamar's yard sale tables. Pretty fast, he finally discerns. Outside the speech and communications building at East Valley College, Mercedes Tanot parks her car. She places her high heels outside and steps into them before alighting. Mercy's tall, beautiful, and just about fed up with her job and life it seems. She trots into her office a little before 8 a.m. A tumbler of coffee in hand, she sits on her chair and from the desk drawer, takes out some pain relievers for her headache. She gulps it down with the coffee and begins her day. Minutes go by and her colleague and friend Francis walk in. She asks what sin Mercy committed to having a class at 8 in the morning. Mercy replies that earning a master's in political discourse in the plays of Shakespeare and Shaw must be it. When Francis tells Mercy that she's early because she just started race walking at the track, Mercy is repulsed by that thought. She hopes she never turns out like that. Nothing in life excites her anymore. Mercy seems just about done with her life as a professor. She wonders if she even makes any difference to the students in her class. If only she did but she can't compete with Twitter and Facebook and smartphones. When it's finally time for class, and Mercy is not one bit motivated to leave her chair. Larry rides the bike to the college. He parks it in the lot and is gathering his belongings when it comes to a girl on a scooter. She parks it next to his and compliments Larry's scooter saying it's damn fine. Larry takes the compliment. It got him there with a nickel's worth of gas. He's happy. The cheerful girl makes conversation. Says she didn't see him in the scooter pit the last term. Larry says it's his first day of college ever. The cheery girl loves that. Next, she checks out his appearance. Is he a cop? She asks. Larry refuses, confused why she'd think that. It's because he's tucked in a polo shirt and is wearing large sunglasses. He asks her for directions to the communications building. Miss Chirpy doesn't even know there was one. Mercy stands outside her classroom and peeks in through the small window in the door. She opens the door and is immediately relieved. The class is empty. She counts the heads in the room. Nine. She counts again, this time more enthusiastic. Her day has just been made. She clears her throat and the students turn to face her. She announces that the class is cancelled, because the state charter requires a minimum of 10 students in a class. Mercy is so ecstatic she doesn't have to teach the 8 o'clock lecture. She is about to exit when the front door bursts open, and Larry stumbles in asking if it's speech 217. Mercy sighs dejectedly. She turns around, clearly annoyed, and mutters to Larry to find a seat if he can. She announces her name as she walks up to the front of the class. Miss Taynot. She stands in front of the class, stares at them. They stare back at her. She rolls her eyes and thinks she might as well start teaching. Mercy turns around, grabs a piece of chalk, and writes care on the board. She turns and tells the class if they do not care about this class then neither does she. If they do not participate and show up to class with enough sleep, to make it through 55 minutes 3 days a week at 8 am, then they do not care about speech 217, the art of informal remarks. She urges them to get out if they don't care. She shouts, stares, and waits. Larry looks around the class, just as confused as the rest of them. No one moves. Mercy moves on. It was worth a shot. She starts with an assignment. 
The next time they meet, each of the students will address the class by telling them something they already know how to do. A hand rises. A young man, Steve DiBiase not so innocently calls her Miss Ty Not, making the same mistake she told them not to. When Mercy gives him an unimpressed stare, he corrects himself. Mercy is beyond annoyed. She asks his name. Steve innocently and playfully remarks that she must be dreaming, if he has to stand up and give a speech in his second class. Mercy asks him why he is in her class. The Dean of Admissions suggested to Steve that her class will change his life. Larry, sitting right next to Steve, smiles and is about to say he was told the same thing when Steve's phone rings. Steve's a total dope. He takes the call in the class. Mercy is annoyed beyond reason. While Steve goes on chatting, she walks up to him and gives him an intimidating stare down. She gets him to put the call down and walks away. Larry watches her go with wary caution. She's definitely scary. His next class is Econ 1. Larry rushes into the class which is brimming with students. He recognizes one of his classmates from Miss Taynot's class and sits down next to her. The woman, Lala, tells him Miss Taynot scares her. The girl Larry met in the parking sees him and sits down next to him. She's thrilled to see him again. She asks for his name. Larry introduces him and the woman next to him. Her name is Lala. The young girl, Talia, laughs. Talia decides to call Larry, Lance Corona. She invites Larry to join her scooter gang and feeds her number on his phone. The class begins and Professor Ed Matsutani PhD introduces himself and addresses the class. On the other hand, Mercy's next class has only four students. She cancels it, a little disappointed. She gets home and her husband, Dean Tainat, is watching adult videos on the computer. The second he hears Mercy walk in, he shuts it all down. The loud music stops as Mercy walks by his room and straight into the kitchen. Dean makes conversation with her about how the first day of term calls for celebration. Mercy grabs alcohol from the cabinet, some ice from the fridge, pours it all into a blender. Dean is an unemployed blogger who stays at home, wasting time while Mercy works at the college. He walks up to her, telling her about his day and how he worked some and crushed the weights at the gym. Mercy is distant and bitter in her reactions. While Dean tries to convince her that he's been working, Mercy knows all he does is watch his adult videos. She tells him that. Moving into the living room with her cocktail, Mercy grabs a magazine and sits down. Dean makes a show of not understanding her, but eventually agrees he was watching adult videos, because he's a man and it's what a guy does. They quarrel. Dean argues that everyone has secrets, which Mercy confidently rebuts by saying she doesn't hide anything from him. She tells him everything about her day, both high and low. Mercy complains about her disastrous low in the day, telling him about the class she had to cancel because no one showed up. She takes a swig of her drink and gets a brain freeze. Dean kisses up to her, calling her perfect for doing what she does despite not liking it. Mercy retorts that it gets the bills paid. That hits Dean right in the ego. He justifies himself by saying Mercy hides her jealousy of him being an establishing beachhead in new media, while she still teaches at Vassar of the Valley. Mercy stares him down and tells him she knows he looks at adult videos hoping she doesn't find out, but she does. She gets angry and tells him she doesn't like it. Mercy walks off annoyed. She refills her glass in the kitchen. Disgusted and speechless, Mercy storms off into the balcony and shut the door in Dean's face. The students are giving their speeches in the next class as Mercy had announced previously. Dean Dave steps into the class and takes a seat in the back, observing. After one girl finishes her presentation on women's lacrosse, it's Larry's turn. Larry has some flashcards prepared. As he walks up to the podium, Dean Dave smiles at him, excited to see Larry speak. Larry begins his presentation on how to prepare restaurant-quality French toast. He cracks a joke about how he'll still be speaking in English. Mercy rolls her eyes. He could not be lamer. Larry nervously begins with the key ingredients and goes on to speak about how French toast is made. As he speaks, he looks around the class and everybody in the audience is distracted, doing their own thing. Mid-speech, Mercy rings the bell, stopping Larry. She has heard enough. She thanks him for his speech, unimpressed. Larry takes a seat. Dean Dave, however, is impressed. He turns to Mercy and applauds Larry for being direct and informant. Mercy can barely control just how uninterested she is. She goes, calling the next student. Steve volunteers. He gets up on the stage and speaks into the mic about toaster waffles. No surprise there when everyone but Mercy is impressed by that sad attempt at a speech. The class applauds, giggling. Larry is genuinely impressed that Steve got that idea from his French toast. The class continues. Another guy steps up. He performs five easy dance steps every man should know. Mercy looks at the lot of them, totally unimpressed. Mr. Matsutani's class is in session. Larry is focused and taking notes. Suddenly, his phone buzzes. A text. Scoot. Larry ignores it not knowing who it's from. It buzzes again. It's a message from Talia asking him to look to the left. Larry, also known as Lance for Talia, looks to the left and finds her seated a few rows behind. Larry and Talia start communicating and signing. Mr. Matsutani notices Larry being inattentive. Annoyed at this, he walks up to Larry and sternly demands his phone from him. Larry gets reprimanded, though not badly. He gives Talia an accusing look. After the class ends, Talia takes Larry with her to her scooter gang. Her boyfriend and their friends are waiting by the parking lot. 
Talia kisses Don, her boyfriend, and then introduces Larry as Lance Corona, her classmate and a good guy. Don asks if Lance wants to ride with them. Larry shrugs, sure why not. Don looks him straight in the eye and begins clicking his fingers. The next second, the entire groups join in, clicking their fingers while watching Larry, who is obviously very confused and probably a little weirded out. Talia tells him to snap along or else he can't join the gang. Larry begins snapping, hesitantly so. Don suddenly laughs and invites Larry for a trial run. They ride to Frank's restaurant. The owner, Frank, is Larry's old friend. He seats them down. After having their meal, Larry says he needs to get home to do homework. He realizes that he is actually looking forward to it. The others ask him to stay since they are going shopping later on, so Larry ends up inviting them to the yard sale at Lamar's. The gang follows Larry home and stops by Lamar's yard sale. Upon seeing a huge group of bikers coming into his neighborhood, Lamar asks Larry what kind of thugs he got involved with. Larry tells him it's just his college buddies. Don gets to haggling with Lamar, and Talia gets helped by Bella while searching for clothes to buy. At his home, Larry is studying when Talia walks in uninvited with Sal, a hairdresser. Talia informs him, Sal will be cutting his hair while she inspects his house with distaste. While Larry gets his hair cut, Talia puts the gang up to the task of decluttering his house. She introduces him to Feng Shui. By the time Larry comes out, Talia is done reorganizing his house. Larry is pleasantly surprised at what Talia has done. Talia is totally happy with how Larry looks now with a new haircut. The group whistles and Don officially welcomes Larry to their gang, Street Patrol. On her way out, Talia gives Larry a friendly peck on the lips. Don isn't too pleased to see that while Larry giggles like a schoolgirl and sees her out. The moment he closes the door and turns, he sees Don behind him and gasps. Don doesn't look too happy. In fact, he looks like he might be jealous. He gives Larry a stern stare down, and warns him against falling in love with Talia because men usually do. Larry assures him that had no such intentions anyway. They part in peace and Don leaves. Larry inspects his newly organized house and is amazed by the feng shui. The next morning Larry leaves for classes. On his way, he sees Mercy driving and singing in her car. Larry tries to get her attention, but Mercy is too busy singing along to loud classic music. When she does notice a man trying to get her attention, she pulls her car to the side. Larry knocks on her window and Mercy recognizes him. She lowers her window. Larry tells her he saw her singing and Mercy says that was to drown out the noise of her GPS, which her husband had installed incorrectly. Larry, who used to sell all kinds of stuff at his previous job offers to help Mercy. He sticks his arm and his head inside her window and begins fixing her GPS. He takes her through the steps and though he's completely invading her personal space and it's making Mercy uncomfortable, she appreciates him helping her out. Larry asks her what she is going to make them do in class today, and Mercy replies he'll just have to find out. Larry tells her to follow him and vrooms away on his scooter. Mercy watches him go, a smile playing on her lips. She finds Larry quite interesting. Mercy begins the class by giving them tips on public speaking. She looks at Larry and holds eye contact, as she gives an example of what focal points to focus on during a speech. Larry likes that Mercy's looking at him directly. He smiles and then when catches himself doing so, he straightens up. In the end, Larry's wide smile vanishes, when Mercy says spending too much time on any one focal point may give the person a wrong message. Talia keeps Larry distracted in Professor Matsutani's class. She texts him in the middle of the class which results in Professor catching them. He eventually confiscates Larry's phone. Again, later, after school, they head to a storage room where Talia keeps her collection of clothes. She has plans to open a thrift store later in life. She asks Larry to take off his pants behind a rack and while taken aback at first, Larry complies. Talia helps him find new clothes from her stock. Don shows up at the same time. Talia asks Larry to put his pants back on account of her boyfriend showing up. Don is annoyed but lets it slide since he knows Larry and Talia are only friends. Larry is doing his accounts at Frank's restaurant when Frank offers him a job. Larry works it out with Paul, the boss of Frank's kitchen. Paul gives Larry a task and Larry bangs it out, securing himself a part-time job. In the next class, Larry is running late. When Mercy does not see him in class, she is annoyed and angry. Larry rushes to Mr. Matsutani's class, panting and huffing. He is dressed in new clothes, courtesy of Talia. After taking the professor's permission and handing his cell phone over to him, Larry attends the class. After the class, Larry is clarifying some doubts with his professor when Mercy spots him. She is livid as she walks to him, berating him for showing his face after he skipped her class. Mr. Matsutani confirms Larry was present in class, though somewhat tardy. Mercy doesn't listen to Larry's explanations and goes on scolding him. She tells him he will be the first one up for pop topics in her next class. Larry is rendered speechless as Mercy storms off from there. Talia, who witnessed this exchange finds it weird that Mercy was so upset. It's pouring cats and dogs. Mercy sits in her car, parked at a donut shop, writing up topics for her next class, when she spots Larry and Talia getting out of the car. 
They enter a donut shop together and Mercy is appalled to see them together. She cedes to herself saying maybe that's why Larry went to college so he could score with younger girls, making a highly judgmental assumption. The next day, Larry shows up in class wearing a scarf and back denim jacket. His classmates cheer him on, complimenting his look when Mercy walks in. She aggressively sets a box on the table and announces to Larry to take his turn. She sits at the back of the class. Larry takes a paper off the box and his topic is interior design. He gets up on the podium, a little nervous, but he knows nothing about interior design. But he goes on to talk about how he knows a girl who feng shuied his place. Mercy watches Larry talk, her expression stern and bordering on annoyance. Larry goes on and on about how Taylor rearranged every part of his house and his closet. He has got a completely new wardrobe now. Mercy grinds her teeth, watching him speak. Finally, having heard enough, Mercy asks Larry to be seated. Talia notices a for rent sign on a studio and decides to rent it for her boutique. She meets Larry at Frank's. She trades his boring glasses for he delightedly helps her with her finances, and tells her that she's getting a good deal. Talia hugs Larry affectionately saying, I love you, Lance Corona. Larry's smile fades to a hesitant one, when Don seats himself down in front of them. Intimidated by his stare, Larry just goes back to work. Dean and Mercy end their date night on a sour note. They're both drunk and stumbling out of a restaurant, fighting. Dean complains about how Mercy never smiles, and how she can't even have a date night. Mercy is completely uninterested in whatever slurs Dean is throwing her way. They get in the car and Dean is driving. He complains to Mercy and asks her to hold his leftover cheesecake, so it doesn't slide on the dashboard. Mercy grumbles but complies. Dean is annoyed at her now. He asks if she is looking for a completely different kind of man because he likes himself and all she does is complain. Mercy rebuttals that she works, and he watches adult videos at home pretending to work. Dean scoffs at her accusation. They two continue their argument and in the heat of the moment, Dean comments something bad. Mercy is astounded. That is the end of her patience. She's drunk and now she's super angry. She screams at him to stop the car. After a bit of back and forth, Dean stops the car. He is angry at her too. Mercy gets out of the car and screams at him for being a loser. The two part ways, screaming and shouting slurs at each other as Dean drives away. Mercy is stranded at the bus stop. It is late into the night when Larry and Talia's scooter gang passes by. Talia spots a lone woman at the bus stop and decides to set Larry up with her. When Larry gets to the woman he recognizes her as his professor and offers her a ride. Mercy is drunk and annoyed and she declines. Larry insists and takes Talia's spare helmet for Mercy. The gang leaves and Larry and Mercy are alone at the bus stop. Larry offers Mercy a ride again, but Mercy declines again. She stands up and slips on her heels saying she can walk. When Larry asks, in those shoes. Mercy is both stunned and somewhat comforted by him caring enough to notice her shoes. She agrees to sit behind him, but she won't wear the helmet. Larry tells her it's the law. Mercy, helmet secured on her head, is sitting behind Larry as he rides her home. She complains about him riding slow, to which Larry replies it's because he's never ridden anyone before on a scooter. He just wants to make sure they both get home safely. On the way, Mercy sees her husband getting hauled by the police for a DUI. Her sour mood instantly lifts. Mercy curses at him as Larry rides by their car. The rest of the way home, Mercy is in an ecstatic mood. She's drunk and happy. Larry makes sure to see her at her door. Mercy is unable to get the door open, since she left her purse and her car with the keys in them. She remembers there is a key buried in a plant and Larry takes them out for her. He hands it to her but in her drunken state, Mercy is unable to open the door. She laughs and giggles and sways. She already seems lighter than she has been in weeks. Larry gets the door for her. When Mercy is in and it's time to say goodbye, Larry tells her goodnight Miss Taynot. Mercy reminds him, lifting her ringed hand to his face that she is a missus. Married. In her drunken stupor, Mercy goes on to say that Larry smells really pleasant. She's obviously attracted to him, but Larry is hesitant knowing that she's married. Until Mercy asks him if he would like to kiss her. She is giggling and very much wants Larry to take advantage of her drunkenness. Larry resists at first because he's a gentleman but Mercy just takes the leap and climbs on top of him. The two share an extremely passionate and long kiss. When they break apart, Larry can barely control himself. Mercy is over the top. She wants to do it again, but Larry gains his wits for half a second. He urges her that it is time for them both to do the right thing and pushes Mercy back into her house. He asks her to lock the door, and just so he is not tempted to use her spare key to get inside, he tosses the key to her through the small letter door inside the house. When Mercy peeks through the peephole, she finds Larry headbanging and being ecstatic. He is so happy because he's always had a little crush on Mercy. Mercy sighs longingly, a big smile on her face. The next morning when Dean reaches home in a cab, he finds all his stuff thrown outside the house. He screams at the top of his lungs, cursing Mercy. The class is awkward the next day. Mercy has a huge hangover. While the students go on having a fake debate and making noise, Larry steals glances at Mercy. He doesn't quite like that she looks so solemn. The class dismisses and Mercy calls Larry over to talk. Larry looks at her expectantly but when Mercy speaks, his bubble bursts. He had been hoping things would go ahead with them now that they had kissed, but Mercy is stern and indirect in her apology to him. 
She makes it known that what happened the night before would never happen again, and that it was inappropriate, being that Larry is her student. She requests him to keep this a secret between them, lest the word gets out and her reputation gets tarnished. Larry is disappointed but he agrees. What choice does he have now? Larry goes to the bank and meets with the teller he met before. Now that his mortgage has become a bad debt, he transfers the debt back to the bank. The teller tries to convince Larry to not do this but now Larry is confident. After having studied business and economics, Larry knows what's good for him. He confidently frees himself of the burden and has one month to vacate his house. Larry reminisces with Lamar and confides in him about how he's feeling about leaving his home. He isn't too happy but new beginnings are crucial. Mercy hands out topics for the final exams. When she gets to Larry, his chit says George Bernard Shaw, which reads to him as geography show because of Mercy's loopy handwriting. Mercy shakes her head and lets him have geography show as his topic. Mercy wishes them good luck and class is dismissed. When Mercy gets to her office, Talia is already there talking to Francis. Talia wants to drop her class to open a thrift store of her own. Francis does not think it is a good idea. He calls Mercy to meet Talia who is her star pupil. Mercy is not too thrilled to see Talia there. She tells Francis that they have met already and Talia hints at the wild night it happened. Mercy assumes Larry must have told Talia about everything. They must have their pillow talks every night. Talia laughs at the suggestion and declares how she finds him sweet but Larry's way too old for her. Talia tells Mercy how Lance is forever mute about her. Mercy realizes just how wrong she's been about Larry all this time. As she enters her office, she catches the tail end of Talia and Frances' conversation, where Talia tells her where Lance works and that he makes great French toast. In Mr. Matsutani's class when Larry does not find Talia, he gets worried. After school, Larry visits Talia at her thrift store, where he finds out that she has dropped out of the class. Larry tries to convince her to stay in school, but Talia has her mind set on her shop. She invites him to her grand opening. Larry jokes he might not make it since some people have to study for finals. Larry works day and night studying between his job and classes. His house has been put up for foreclosure. As he drives home one night from work, Larry just takes in the neighborhood he lives in. It's quiet at night and so peaceful. Larry looks around, the feeling finally settling in. He will no longer live here. The thought does not make him so happy, but it is what has to be done. The next day, Larry's house is all cleaned up and he is ready to move. He picks up the last box and casts one last longing glance at his empty living room. With a heavy sigh, Larry is out the door. Larry's classmates are over, helping him with the move in exchange for free lunch. He's moving into a much tiny place and so he asks Lamar and Bella to sell it for him. The pizza delivery guy comes in a BMW car. He steps out and when he turns, Larry is shocked to see that it's Jack. From you, Mart. The guy who fired Larry. Larry hands him the money for the pizza but makes sure to ask for the change. Times are tough, he says, using the same line Jack used while firing him. But Larry can't bring himself to be so mean. He's a softy. And a good man. He lets Jack keep the change and Jack thanks him enthusiastically. Everyone has a goodbye lunch with Larry. Bella hugs him a teary goodbye and Lamar gives Larry lottery tickets as a parting gift. Larry laughs at the joke. He's emotional to leave but at the same time, excited for a new beginning. He's feeling bittersweet. Mercy has been living alone now that she's divorced Dean. She heads on to make herself a drink. But before she can drink it, she stares at the glass but thinks better of it and makes another decision. She needs to start pulling herself together. Frances comes ringing at her door and tells Mercy that there isn't a woman in this world who hasn't been where Mercy is at. Frances helps Mercy pull herself together, get her house clean, get into exercising, and make healthy decisions. Larry is walking to his class when he runs into Mercy. They exchange pleasantries and Mercy asks if she should have been calling him Lance all this time. Larry throws his head back in a pleasant laugh. Only one person calls him Lance. Mercy nods, smiling. She tells him she met Talia and that she found her interesting. Larry agrees. Tells her that Talia changed his wardrobe from head to toe. Mercy had kind of put that together already. Mercy and Larry walk towards the classroom, and she asks him if he's ready for his finals. She tells him he's the last one to go today and Larry is pleasantly relieved. Right outside the door, Mercy thanks him out of the blue. Larry is confused. Mercy clears it by telling him that he kept their secret. She smiles affectionately at him, calling him a gentleman. For the first time in a long long time, Mercy teaches with complete enthusiasm. Her energy radiates through every student in the class. She gets them to loosen up. When Dean Dave walks into this scene, he is utterly shocked. He has never seen Mercy's class so lively before. One by one, the students give their presentations and it's finally Larry's turn. Larry begins his presentation on geography show. He goes through it by telling everyone about his experience as a Navy cook. How he explored the vast expanse of the sea and saw so much of the world. From the Great Lakes to the Southern Stars, he's seen it all. He's been around the world five times and it's been a journey of a lifetime for him. Larry charms his classmates and Mercy with his speech and presentation. Mercy, especially, is impressed with him. Larry's ease and his natural charisma shine brightly, and Mercy can't help but fall in love. He goes on to thank Mercy and charms her even more, by quoting George Bernard Shaw which was supposed to be his topic before. 
He mains eye contact with Mercy while he speaks, and sparks fly. Thoroughly impressed by him, everyone claps and hoots at the end of his presentation. There's a blush on Mercy's face that she can't hide. Larry aces Dr. Matsutani's class as well. He's on fire. When Mercy sits down to grade her students, she can't help but smile the entire time as she gives Larry good score. Larry is at work when Mercy walks into his restaurant. They watch each other and make eye contact. The sparks are felt all the way at Talia's table. There is some obvious attraction and sensual tension between the two. Mercy sits down with Francis and Larry greets them. Mercy introduces Larry as the student she was telling Francis about earlier. Francis slips up and says the one that smells so nice. Mercy saves the game by telling Larry she gave him really good score. Larry is all smiles. He can't express his gratitude. Mercy asks him to call her by her name and not Miss Tainot since she's not his teacher anymore. Mercy looks so happy. She hopes Larry isn't taking her class next term, but before Larry can answer her, his boss calls him over. Just before he leaves, Mercy stops him and compliments him for being a great student. Larry tells in return that she's a great teacher. When he gets to the kitchen, Larry can barely keep his calm. His smile is mile wide and he's pumped up with renewed vigor. He looks across at Mercy and at the same time, she looks back, their eyes filled with a look of mutual understanding and desire. A few months pass and a new term begins. Dean Dave is teaching Tai Chi in the gardens and Steve has joined his class. Dr. Matsutani's class, as compared to the previous term, has only a handful of students including Larry. Mercy is dejected at finding her class only has eight students this semester. But just when she is about to dismiss them, in comes her students from the previous term. Steve, Mac, Lala, and Natalie. But Larry is missing. When Mac asks where he is, Lala tells Mercy that her class changed Larry's life. Mercy can't help but smile at hearing that. And her smile says she knows exactly where Larry is. After the class Mercy makes it back to her office and finds a note waiting for her there. It says, French toast. With map coordinates to put in the GPS in her car. Mercy blushes and smiles so wide, she cannot stop. The map genie leads Mercy straight to Talia's thrift store. Talia and Mercy greet each other as two friends would. Talia gives Mercy the directions to Larry's apartment. As Mercy climbs up the stairs to Larry's apartment, she is nervous. She takes deep breaths and calms herself. At the same time, Larry opens the door. He puts a spare key in the potted plant. Mercy smiles when she sees him. Larry takes her name and the two of them stand face to face. Smiles on both their faces. Larry affirms that what Lala had said was true. Mercy's class changed his life because he met her. Mercy's happiness shines on her face and the two lean in for a passionate kiss. Larry asks Mercy if she's hungry and she replies, seductively so, that she is. The two enter Larry's new apartment, smiling and laughing as they start their new journey together.